<laughs> yeah. Yeah, in that specific situation, yes, mom is the word. All right, so tonight we are talking. Thank you for your patience. Last week I was literally in bed the whole day working from the bed with my head on the pillow because the moment I sat up, my head felt like it was going to explode. Um, and still I'm feeling like remnants of that sickness um, around. So it's all good. We're here. We're ready to study the doctrine of Jesus and the virgin birth, which hopefully will give us a clearer understanding. Now you can see kind of a progression with which we're studying this systematic theology. We started with God because God is the foundation of all theology. We talked about that. Then we moved to Scripture, which reveals God. And then what's the very first thing that Scripture talks about? Other than God obviously creating the heavens and the earth. It talks about man and sin. That's where we left off two weeks ago, where I felt we had a very big God moment two weeks ago. Okay? Um, and so now we move into, okay, if man and sin entered in Genesis 3, well, we get the promise of a Messiah in Genesis 3.15. So we need to talk about Jesus. We need to talk about the virgin birth. And then we'll work through next week will be the doctrine of salvation. We'll get into the doctrine of the church. We'll get into the doctrine of last things um, as well. And then we'll, we'll wrap up the study. But this has been a 10-week or this will be a 10-week study on doctrine, the fundamentals of the faith. We said it at the beginning of the series. You have open-handed issues, you have closed-handed issues. These are the closed-handed issues. They are not up for debate. And if somebody does not hold to these beliefs, then it is very difficult to call them a Christian, okay? Because they do not believe the Bible because this is what the Bible teaches. So let's talk, and I'm just going to ask, I'm going to open this up and I think it's a silly question because it's an obvious question, but what do you think the importance of having a doctrine of Jesus is? It's the foundation of Christianity, for sure. To tell you who he is. For knowledge, absolutely. Paul tells us to have this mind among you, which was also among Christ Jesus, which means if we're going to have that mind, we have to study the person of that mind, right? If you're going to choose to follow someone as master, yes. who has absolutely, absolute authority over your life, for sure, then it's imperative that you have an intimate knowledge of that individual. 100%. And our job as Christians is to pursue Christ. And so we have to know what we are in pursuit of. Because, yes, to be like Him, right? That is... I mean, literally, the, the Greek definition of Christian is little Christ. In Christ. Right? Yeah, in Christ, little Christ. So we need to know what that means. So let's talk about what is the doctrine of Jesus. But we're going to start with this verse because this is the verse. One of the premier verses in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Also, the doctrine of Jesus Christ is called Christology or Christology, okay? The study of Christ, right? So if you see a book or if you're in a, in a, uh, a systematic theology book and one chapter is labeled Christology, you know that's about Christ, okay? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory Glory as of the only Son from God the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the verse that sums up a lot of Christology and, every, and really much of what we need to know regarding Christology. And that's where we're going to jump off from tonight. But I do feel like we need to open the night in prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. And then we will jump into answering this question of what is the study or the doctrine of Jesus. Okay, God, I love you and I thank you for tonight. I thank you for bringing these men here through your providence to be in this class tonight. I pray that we would worship well tonight. I pray that we would have our hearts opened and our ears attentive so that we can learn more about your son who you sent to die on the cross for us so that we might inherit eternal life. 
Jesus, I thank you for being willing to come to this earth, taking on the form of a servant and being willing to die the death that we deserved. Spirit, I pray that you come to this room and I pray that you would enlighten our minds. I pray that you would indwell our hearts and I pray that you would help us to seek more closely to Jesus. And it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's talk here about what is the doctrine of Jesus or Christology. The simple definition of Christology is this, is from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. He said, Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man in one person and will be so forever. Being fully God and being fully man is the definition of Christology. When Jesus walked this earth, was he fully man? Yes. Okay, what does that mean? He was fully man. He was, he had sinless. Huh? He had no, no sin. We're going to talk about that. He did not have a sin nature. We're going to talk about how that's possible. He was flesh and bone. What do flesh and bones do? Do they get tired? Yeah. Jesus slept, right? Yeah. right? Do they get hungry? And he wept. <laughs> and he wept. He felt emotion. He experienced everything that we can. Yeah. That's the way to say it, right? He experienced everything that we experience. He was fully human. While he was on the earth, was he also fully God? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Now... <clears throat> Is he still fully human? Is he still fully God? Yes, because he will be forever, right? And he's coming back. So it is very important that we understand, and it's hard to grasp, right? And we're going to talk about this, but how can one thing be two things completely at once? Okay? That's what we have to kind of wrap our minds around. But again, like we've said through doctrine, it's not for us to understand completely. It's for us to kind of grasp and then go, I have faith. I trust, right? Okay. So let's give a brief history of the doctrine of Jesus. In the early church, a few centuries after Jesus' death and resurrection, the church wrestled with the nature of Jesus Christ. The debate centered on whether Jesus was fully divine, fully human, or a combination of the two. The Council of Nicaea in A.D. 325 affirmed the full divinity of Jesus Christ and declared that he was the same substance as the Father. He was divine. Okay? Now, I want to give you, and it's not in your notes, so I want you to understand what the Council of Nicaea was. It was early in the 4th century, 325. The Christian church was grappling with this idea of Jesus and his two natures. Some, the, th some theologians only believed that Jesus was divine, while the other camp said, no, he was fully human. And the debate led to a significant theological like schism. And because the theology kind of ruled the day back then, it also led to a big political division as well, because theology was what reigned supreme at that time. Okay. So that led to the Council of Nicaea. In 325, Emperor Constantine called a council of bishops together in the city of Nicaea in modern-day Turkey. The purpose was to do, address the issue of Christology and bring unity to the church. There were over 300 bishops that were in attendance, and the debate raged on this. Some bishops argued that Jesus was a created being and therefore not fully divine, while others, led by Athanasius, argued that Jesus was of the same substance of the Father, that he was God, which led to what came out of that council, something that we know called the Nicene Creed. Okay, It was a creed that came out of these 300 bishops coming together, finding common ground and saying, this is what we believe. The Nicene Creed was uh, widely accepted, um, there was still debate in the Western church over uh, its completeness, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But that led to, the debate in the West led to the Council of, 
of uh, Chalcedon in 451 AD, where they really solidified it there. So this is the creed that came out of Nicaea, and it says this. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. Agree with that? Yeah. Yes. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, begotten of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became a man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and on the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Sound good? Yeah. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who has spoken through the prophets. Again, we would have no issue with that. Okay? This is where I think the debate started to rage. Okay? They say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Because I know you heard the word Catholic, and you're like, oh, no. No, 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 no. It's a little c. When you see a little c, it's a not a proper noun, which means Catholic just means universal. That's all it ever means. So when you see a little c Catholic, they just mean we believe in one universal church. If that was a big c, a capital C if you were in kindergarten, right, then it would be the Roman Catholic Church we're talking about. That is not what they are addressing here. But they do say, I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, which is where I believe they messed up, right? Because right. we don't believe in regeneration through baptism. Right. We believe that baptism is a sacrament and obedient. Okay, Our Lutheran brothers and sisters would say, no, we believe in regeneration through baptism, which is why they baptize infants and things like that. Okay, Which is why that debate kind of raged through the Western church. Um, in the Reformation, during the Reformation, Christology was an area of important debate, particularly in relation to the doctrine of justification by faith. The Reformers emphasized the importance of faith in Christ and the sufficiency of His work on the cross for salvation. Why is that important when we say the sufficiency of His cross or His death on the cross for salvation? He would die for our sins. He died for our sins. The solution is finished. That's, that's the answer, right? The solution is finished. Salvation occurs through Jesus' death on the cross. That's it. And in the Reformation times, we know they were dealing with the Roman Catholic Church who told us, no, you got to pay a little bit more money so your family can go to heaven, right? Or things of that nature. No. The, once for all. And the... But, but that is the, the correct answer to this question, right? The once for all was sufficient, okay? That's it. When something is sufficient, it is over, okay? The words, it is finished, are a pretty clear demarcation line, which means a stopping point, right? It, wasn't, it didn't say to be continued, dot, dot, dot. It said it is finished, and that's why it's sufficient, Okay? So let's talk about the importance of the doctrine of Jesus, okay? First, we're going to look at key beliefs, okay? So these key beliefs all kind of go into um, this importance. They're really uh, the same thing. So if you want to, if you want to, there's verses there that I left for you, some a little bit different than the others. I just want to get the whole scope of Scripture, but if you skip down from two, the importance of the doctrine of Jesus to key beliefs, it's the same, okay, with a few uh, more verses added in. So let's talk about this. Jesus' divinity, okay? This is his nature as God. He was fully God. That's something that we have to understand. And in the book Portable Seminary, David Horton says that there's two ways that we see Christ's divinity through his own actions. One is called the implicit Christology, and one is explicit. 
Okay? It's in your notes there. Uh, letter A, under Jesus' divinity, key beliefs. If you're on key beliefs, it should be uh, the small Roman numerals number two. Okay? So what does something implied mean? If we say that, that, it, that I implied something, does it mean that I spoke it directly? No. no. Okay? Correct. It's implied. But Jesus referred to his di divinity in an implied way in the Gospels. And he also was very explicit, which means he definitely said it, in the Gospels as well. So let's look at this implicit Christology. Okay? Number one. Jesus spoke as one who possessed authority greater than that of the Old Testament. You can find that in Matthew 5, 31 and 32. These are not in your notes, so you just might want to take these down. He possessed authority greater than that of the Old Testament, than Abraham, Jacob, and the temple. He referred to Abraham in John 8, 53. He referred to Jacob in John 4, 12. And he referred to being greater than the temple in Matthew 12, 6. He also implied his divinity by claiming to be Lord of the Sabbath in Mark 2, 28. And he even implicitly spoke to his divinity when he said and claimed that every destiny or that the very destiny of every person depended on how they responded to him. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, 11, 6, and Mark 8, 34 through 36. So through those things, by saying, I'm greater than the Old Testament, I have more authority than Abraham, I have more authority than Jacob, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, oh, and by the way, your eternity, your eternity depends on how you respond to me He's implicitly saying, I am God. I am divine. Okay? I, I believe in one of those passages of Scripture, he even says, before Abraham was, right? That would imply divinity, right? When, when God met Moses, he said, tell them, I am that I am sent you, right? right, right, right. Which means I existed and I will continue to exist. And Jesus is bringing up that same before Abraham was, I was, right? It's, it's implied divinity, okay? Which then leads us to his, the explicit Christology, which is revealed by the titles that he used to him, for himself. He did refer to himself as the Messiah and Christ. So if you want to write Messiah in your side notes there, I can give you some verses on that. Mark eight twenty seven through 30. And Mark 14, 61 and 62 is where he claimed to be the Christ and the Messiah. What was the first one? Mark 8, 27 through 30. Yeah. All three of them? After Mark 2, 28. No, you're good. Oh, Mark 10. Yeah. Matthew 10, 32 through 33 is where he claimed that all the destiny of everyone depended on their response to him. Right. Also, Matthew eleven six, 6, and then Mark 8, 34 through 36. Okay? Now, again, he explicitly referred to himself also as the Son of God, which we find in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 through 27, and Mark 12, 1 through 9. I forget exactly. It might be mere Christianity. Anybody ever read? I'm sorry. Anybody ever read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? Okay. I love C.S. Lewis. Yeah. C.S. Lewis is incredibly difficult to read. <laughs> I have, I have, I have started. I have started reading Mere Christianity probably five times, and put it up each time. But there's, I, I think it's mere Christianity. I could be wrong. It could be a different book by C.S. Lewis, but I know for a fact it's C.S. Lewis. He said there's really three ways that you can deal with Jesus Christ. We're speaking specifically about his divinity here, right? 
There's three ways. One, you can discount him as a liar. He claimed to be God. He's lying, right? Or you could discount him how many people nowadays may discount him as a lunatic, right? This guy's calling himself God. He's crazy. But if you cannot discount him as a liar, and if you cannot discredit him as a lunatic, then the only option that you are left with is declaring him as Lord, which I think is a very apt way to look at this. If Jesus called himself God, which we know that he clearly did. I gave you scripture references to back that up. And if he also says that he's the truth, the way, and the life, then you can't discount him as a liar. Because what facts do you have to prove that he's not? Also, if you claimed him to be a lunatic, let's think about the apostles and the demise that they met 10 to 60 years after Jesus' life. Now, I don't know about you, okay? Every single one of those apostles died because of the message of Jesus Christ. Gary, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you going to die for somebody who's a crazy? Are you going to give your life for their message if they're crazy? No. No. Jerry, what about you? Matt? No. The proof of the apostles, I mean, listen, every one of them given the opportunity to recant, all they had to say is, listen, it's all made up. And they get to go free. But they knew it wasn't made up. Because John even wrote in his first epistle, listen, we are eyewitnesses of the things that we have seen, of the things that we have heard, and of the things that we have touched with our hands. They believed it to be true. So if we have disproved the fact that he was a liar, because he wasn't, and if we know that he's not a lunatic, just based on the example that the apostles gave with the rest of their life, then the only option we have when it comes to Jesus' divinity is to declare him as Lord, according to C.S. Lewis. Okay? The Bible also teaches us that in the witness of three, there's truth. Mm -hmm. We have 12 disciples that believe the same thing. Right, which is four times the required amount, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I know. And that that's just that's, that gets to the whole point, right? We can't call him a liar. We can't call him a lunatic. Therefore, we have to call him Lord, is what C.S. Lewis says, and I think it's great. So that's Jesus' divinity, okay? You have those verses. He declared himself to be Christ and Messiah. That's significant because that was a promise that was given all the way back in the Old Testament, Okay? So we move then to Jesus' humanity. Remember, he's fully God and he's fully human, okay? This is what we call the incarnation of Jesus Christ, okay? Incarnation brings with it the idea of wrapping something up, okay? Wrapping in flesh and bones, okay? And let me give you some, act, some scriptures, and I have them written down there for you. The first one comes from Isaiah 7, 14. We should know this one. Maybe we don't, but this is the promise of the virgin birth. The virgin birth is the pathway by which Jesus became fully man. Okay? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Which Emmanuel means what? Lord with us. So if I were you right now, I would circle the word Emmanuel at the end of that verse, and I would draw an arrow, and I would write God with us, or Lord with us. But that way you have that note. So every time you see the word Emmanuel, so when we sing songs on Sunday morning that talk about Emmanuel, we're talking about God with us, right? The great Christmas hymn, O come, O come, Emmanuel, right? O come, O come, God with us, right? That's important. 1 Timothy 3.16, great indeed we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. There you go with that incarnation. The manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on by the world and taken up in glory. And then Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 says this, 
Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. What are the same things that he partook of? Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. Thank you. Okay. That through death he might destroy the one that has the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to make him, or he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Which is going to lead us to a very interesting question later on. Okay? All of this is summed up in letter B. I asked you, how can you have two things that are fully 100% something also be 100% incorporated into something else? Okay? And theologically, what they bring up and what they talk about is this idea of what's called the hypostatic union. We've talked about it before, but I want to make sure that we hit on it. It says this, the hypostatic union refers to the doctrine that in one person, Jesus Christ, there are two distinct but inseparable natures, a fully divine nature and a fully human nature. So, that's what the doctrine of Christology is going to boil down to. You have Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man, 100% at the same time. I got a question. You're I fine. Apologize no. Okay. Guys, again, any question is a welcomed question when we're talking about things like this. Please ask that. I read scripture and now Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Yep. So now, uh, when he comes back, he will, will he or will he not call himself a son of man? He will uh, question. I don't know if I can answer that. Is son, of man, is son of man an appropriate title for him? Yes, because it showed his dominion over creation. So when he referred to himself as a son of man, he came, and, and Paul even references this, I think, in Romans, where he said, the second Adam has come. See, when, when God created Adam back in the garden, he gave him dominion over all creation. Correct. And then Adam fell Correct. and marred that relationship. But now the second Adam has come, who is the son of man. He is the preeminent example. He is the one who rules over dominion. So that, that title is still appropriate because he, as we said at the very beginning of this, still 100% man. Yep. 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 It is. But there's a more appropriate title that Jesus is going to come back with. And you read that in Revelation 19, where it says he comes riding on a white horse, and down the side of his leg it says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the title that he's going to rule and reign with, because that's the title that he does rule and reign with. Does that make sense? Doesn't mean Son of Man's not an appropriate title for him anymore. In fact, it was, I, I believe it was his favorite title for himself in Matthew, if I'm not mistaken. Could have been, it's one of the Gospels. But like, that's how he referred to himself the most often in that Gospel. It's still an appropriate designation for him. But when he comes back, the most appropriate is going to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yep, 100%. Would understand. Yep. He understands what we go through. Yep, 100%. And we are going to hit on that. So we got these two natures, right? They're separate, they're distinct, yet fully one. So divinity, right? Jesus referred to his di di divinity. We've already hit that, but here's some other verses. John 10, 30. I and the Father are one. Okay. If he and the Father are one, that means exactly what the Nicene Creed said, right? He's not, he's God from God. He is God of the same substance. Uh, on what you just said, what, how 
in the ship when he was walking on water. Yeah. He was man, but yet he was God. Right. And Peter got out. Dominion over creation. Yeah. Yep. 100%. And then we have uh, the, the Christological hymn in, in Philippians 2, 5 through 9, <laughs> where Paul writes this great Christology, okay? It is a hymn, essentially, but he said this, Had this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now we have to be careful when we read that verse, because it says that he emptied himself, right? right. Jesus did not push pause on the divine nature to become human. Okay? But that emptying of oneself is... Is what well, it, it can, but there have been condemned heresies that have taken that too far. Right. That have said he took off his God coat and hung it on a rack, came down to earth for 33 years, and then put the God coat back on, okay. right? Which we know is not true because right. he right. walked on water, right. he turned water into wine. Right. He said, I and the Father are one. Well, any man who is not God and claims to be God is in trouble. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So when we say that he emptied himself, what this is, is he goes on to explain it. He goes, um, he took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. So there's, there's this idea, like at any moment, we know that Christ was able to use the divine nature because it still existed within him. He multiplied fish and loaves, for crying out loud, and fed 5,000 men, which implies that there were probably over 10,000 people. Right. Luke says that, in Luke you can read that uh, the year that was cut off by... Uh, yeah. Jesus touched it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's the divine nature. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, also a great passage speaking to the divinity of Christ because it says... Long ago and in various ways, God spoke to us through the prophets, which we know, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah. That's how God spoke to his people. And he says, now he's spoken to us through his son, who is the exact imprint of his nature. He is God, is what Hebrews 1, I, that's one of my favorite verses. Uh, but then uh, it also emphasizes his humanity. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, under the law to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might have adoption as sons. And then in Luke 2.52, we also know that Jesus went through, in his humanity, a maturation process. Jesus grew in wisdom, in the stature, and in favor with God and man. So there was a maturity that also took place within Jesus. And let me just say this. This is a side note. It's not in your notes. But if I were you and you do not have Luke 2.52 highlighted, circled, emphasized somehow in your Bible, you should. Because this is exactly the blueprint for how we should grow as men. He grew in wisdom and in stature, which means that he grew intellectually. Okay, He grew physically. So your intellectual health is important. Your physical health is important. And he also grew in favor with God, so your spiritual health, and man, your social health. There's four domains by which we should grow as human beings. Intellect, physical fitness, spirituality, and socially. Okay? We call it holistic growth. The whole person grows. All four of those things. If we can grow in one of the, if, if we can grow in those areas every day, then that is a good way to grow. And literally, the last one being holistic. All four of them together is holistic. So you have, you have intellectually, socially, spiritually, and physically. So think about that for a second, right? 
if our focus is to grow holistically as a person and we're to have this mind among us like Jesus Christ, we should follow his model of how he grew. Well, he grew in wisdom, which means read a book once in a while, okay? He grew physically, which means walk around a little bit because you want to age well, right? We want to take care of the body that God has given us and steward the body that God's given us. So let's do a little physical activity. Am I asking you to go to the gym and bench 225? No, because I can't even bench 225. I've never been able to in my life. But, again, I wasn't the one that played at Michigan. You've been confused this whole time. No. I know. No. My younger brother, Jordan, set the record for defensive backs at Michigan and did 225 like 27 times. Really? Yeah, it was, it's insane. He also has short arms, so it makes it easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. It's free and recorded in Living Forever, so it's okay. I can just keep sending it to him and jabbing him. Um, but no, we need to grow physically, okay? Take care of yourself. Right. At minimum, get up and walk the dog, okay? That's at least physical activity. Uh, grow socially. We need to make sure our social relationships are healthy, okay? Make sure we're being influenced the correct way. And then grow spiritually. That one, I think, speaks for itself. All right? So let's get into the third key belief about Jesus, and this is called the immutability of Jesus Christ. Anybody know, and it's defined right there, so you can't cheat, what does immutability mean? Unchanging. Unchanging. Okay, before Abraham was, I was, I am, yeah. right? Same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, biblical support of this, Psalm 102, 25 and tw through 27. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are at work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, and you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same and your years have no end. It's given down to James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation and no shadow due to change. To put this simply, and I want to move on so that we get to the atonement and the virgin birth, but Jesus does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we mean when we talk about the immutability. We have <coughs> this divine nature, right? This hypostatic union, this God in the flesh, 100% God, 100% man, and his nature and his character never changes, which then leads to the impeccability of Jesus Christ, okay? I know immutability, impeccability, they can get it a little confusing. What does impeccability mean? Without sin. Without fault. Without sin. And some will go as far as to define it by saying, without the ability to sin, which is interesting, okay? Without the, yeah, okay, got it. Which is interesting, because by definition, the impeccability of Jesus Christ says that he could not sin. But that makes me wonder a little bit, and I tend to ask a lot of questions. If Jesus could not sin... Could he be tempted in every way in which we were? No. So that's where I kind of cut off the definition a little bit. And listen, I don't want to lead you down the wrong path. I don't think, like, we understand that Jesus was without sin. Perfect and spotless lamb before the Father. There's a lot of people that would go one way or the other. Could he sin? Could he not have sinned? It all boils down to one letter. Those are words. Yeah, one <laughs> oh, would or could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. W or C. I was like, no, those are words. But yeah, you're right. Sorry. Very confused. <laughs> it's the resi I feel like it's more has to do with the resistance. His resistance That's what I thought. That's what I thought. It was, it was ironclad. Right. Where there was, there's nothing on earth that could have possibly Actually, pierced. he showed Adam his flesh was his downfall, basically, and he gave into it. Right. Jesus in the flesh. Right. The trouble, the, the trouble for the devil was Jesus knew who he was. Right. Yeah. And the devil knew who he was too. So yeah. How powerful he That's why he's Right. Right. 
Right, right. Down fully clothed in the armor of God, it, it's, it's impediment yeah, it does, couldn't get through. It yeah. So I want, I feel like that's the way you kind of look at it, because right? Where will. if you're at the pinnacle, um, you, know, you, you can be tempted all you want. You're unable to sin because that armor of God is going to hold no matter what. And if you're, you're able to sin, you would lead one to believe that what you what you want to. I don't believe that he would want to. Hold on, there's a lot of crosstalk. And I knew this was going to happen, that's why I'm just sitting back and letting it. Hold on a second. I am, because I knew it was going to happen. Hold on. Jeremiah and then Craig, okay? Okay, right. Do we, though? Do we hate sin? Because... I, Right, correct. right. Craig, what were you going to say? I think, I think he was very capable of sinning, but he was, I, I think um, one of his main objectives may have been to, to be the example of what Adam should have been. Exactly. Yeah, so, 100%. So could he have, could, could he sin? Yeah, I, I think that, I think by saying that he couldn't sin, we're putting God in the box. And then the argument can be, well, wait a minute, Adam wasn't God, Jesus was. But so you can go back on that. Yeah, but even Paul makes but even Paul makes the connection between the first Adam and the second Adam. So I think you're right on track. And I think Mr. Ford, you're right on track too. Like the difference between could and would, right? <coughs> I don't think scripture can be true to say that Jesus was tempted in every way in which we were if he did not have the ability to sin. Right. Because we even read verses in Hebrews that talked about him suffering when he was tempted. Exactly. <laughs> so, so that's what's interesting, right? Because, listen, the worst mistake that we can make is to underestimate the ability of Satan. But on the same level of that, another worst mistake we can make is to overestimate the ability of Satan as well. So when it comes to the whole temptation of Jesus, what I, what I think is, again, I think the difference between could and would. Now, listen, I don't have, like, significant scripture to back this up. But we also know that Satan's number one issue is what? Pride. So I think, and this is all speculation, do not write this down, but I would think that he's like, I think I can get him. I think I can tempt that humanity aspect. If he's 100% human, just like these other fools are, I think I can get him. Oh, you're hungry for 40 days? Why don't you eat this or make these stones turn into bread? Right? And what's interesting to me is you brought up the, war, the armor of God, right? He you know he wanted. But what was Jesus' response to the temptation? It was always scripture, right? Right. So when we think about the armor of God, and this is completely off track, but I want to hit it because I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. The armor of God talks about the helmet of salvation, your feet shall with the preparation of the gospel, right? The shield of righteousness, all these other things, right? Your loins girt about with truth. All of those are defensive weapons. They're meant to take blows. There's one weapon that is purely offensive, the word of God. And that should speak to the importance of the word of God. It is the only offensive, like, it is the only scud missile we have, <laughs> right? Everything else is fortified behind bricks and mortar where we're standing there just taking on these fiery darts from the enemy until we say, no, go, right? That's why this book is so important. And that's why the message of this book is so important. Oh, for sure. I mean, he was asking this body, if I don't have to go through this, yep. take it away from it. Right, he right. Was, because he was sinless. He, was he knew he was going to get every sin from the world put on his back right. from the beginning of yep. time until the future end yep. of time. All right. He was sweating. That's, that's bleeding. That's, he was that's, sweating. That's, sweating. That's sweating. Not just bleeding. He was unimaginable, sweating blood. Unimaginable. That you're, he paid for my sins, and he didn't... Personally, know me 2,000 years ago. I mean, think about that. But that... Sins were 2,000 years future. Which is a great lead-in, Brad, because now we're going to talk about the atonement. 
<laughs> Great job. May I should hire you to segue every time. So this is our last key belief, okay? And we may have to do the virgin birth to start next week, okay? okay. <clears throat> but the atonement of Christ is so important, okay? I want you to write two words out in the margins of your notes. Propitiation. P-R-O-P-I-T-I-A-T-I-O-N. And I just did that off the cuff, so if I did it wrong, do not judge me. Okay? And the second word is expiation. E-X-P-I-A-T-I-O-N. E X. So, yeah. Expiation. E X P I A T I O N. That's because he went to Michigan. I only went to BBC. We didn't have spelling classes. Um, so, we're going to talk about these much, like a little bit more in depth when we talk about the doctrine of salvation. But these are key concepts when it comes to the atonement of Jesus Christ. Propitiation, simply defined, is the payment for sin. Payment for sin. So when you read that in the Bible, and we already read one verse that talked about it in, in Hebrews, that means the payment was made for sin. Expiation is the removal of sin and what comes with it. Guilt, shame, all of that. I don't want to say that that's wrong, but the idea of propitiation and expiation actually comes from Leviticus. And those lambs weren't necessarily volunteering, right? So we go to the, so when we talk about this, Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then skipping down to 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's what the atonement did. Jesus' sole purpose on this earth is exactly what Brad was describing in the Garden of Gethsemane. It all led to that night. It all was there to say, this is your moment. Now, we argue and believe that there was a little bit of trepidation from the humanity of Jesus saying, if this cup can pass, please let there be another way. Why? Because it was through his wounds that we were healed. His blood that was shed that made atonement for our sin. Right. See, if we were to stand under the curse of Adam before God, we stand guilty regardless of who we are. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there is nothing that we can do to ever pay that back. Our debt is always being accounted for. Our debt is always accruing. The, the bank ledger is in the red, if you will, when it comes to sin. Because Adam was our representative. Because Adam sinned and therefore cast all of humanity into sin. And standing before God, we are guilty. Because we know God is a righteous and just judge. But yet there was a lamb that stood slain before the foundation of the world to shed his blood and make payment for that sin. 
which we'll get into this when we talk about salvation, but I want to give you a precursor tonight. When you talk about the Day of Atonement back in Leviticus, I think it's 17 or 18. Okay. We all know about the lamb that was led to the slaughter, right? He's the youngest lamb without imperfections. The priest would take it, take the sins of the people and put it on his head and then slit its throat, right? Massive bloodshed, right? Because it wasn't just one lamb. It was a lamb for all the families, the one-offs. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of lambs killed on one day. Like, think about that for a second. That's a lot of blood. But what gets lost in that entire picture of the Day of Atonement is there was a second lamb, a goat, the scapegoat. So here's our picture, right? The first lamb makes the payment for sin. The second lamb, they're instructed, put all the sins on the head of the goat and then release it to be set free. Because not only are your sins paid for, but they're removed completely. That's what the atonement is. And it only happens because of who Jesus was. Because he was fully God, because he was fully man, and because he came to die. It's my favorite saying, and I will continue to say it. He came and lived the life we should have lived died the death that we deserved and then rose again victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave. And when Jesus said, it is finished, the atonement was complete. The payment for sin had been made. What did I leave out? That we might live. Yeah. That we might live. So... We have five minutes. I'm not even going to try to get through the virgin birth. We will do that next week when we start talking about salvation because it all still ties together. You'll have these notes. I'll make sure that we get the salvation notes. So five minutes, Q&A, anything from this week, previous weeks, let's talk. Adam. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we, we have been over this numerous times. Yes, Eve took of the fruit. But Adam was the one that sinned because in Genesis 2, the command to not eat from the tree was given before Eve was even created, which put the re responsibility on Adam to disciple his wife, and he did not. And, thank you, was standing right next to her, and she gave it to him to eat. Exactly. He is. Well, that's true with us. You know, and that's why Christ said that we got to be in subjection to those in authority over. There's, there is a method of order that we follow. But even the devil is a created being. Right, but he's still above us. He's an angel. The angels are a little higher than we are. Is that why we might be told not to mock? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, that's probably one of the faults of this Well, let's, let's, yeah, I, I want to be very clear. Like, when we talk about Satan, <laughs> he's, you're not going to like that I say this, he's smarter than you are. Yeah. Okay? But, and, and Brad said this the other night, and it, like, hit me, and I can't stop thinking about it. We have to be very careful that we do not place the attributes that we know to be true about God on the devil. Because even the devil is subject, subject to God. Yeah. So while he is smarter than us, he is not equal and opposite to God. That's why we have said multiple times, good and evil are not equal and opposite forces. Oh, no, right. Okay? The devil is not omnipresent. He cannot be everywhere. And I will also caution you with this. Y'all, I forget who the famous actor back in the day was, but he always used to say, the devil made me do it, right? Okay, Flip Wilson, right? I'm pretty sure the devil had bigger fish to fry than Flip Wilson. <laughs> okay? Sure, it's, it's funny. We have a sin nature. We do. There's a, there's a great book called The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis that I think is, 
is is a phenomenal is a phenomenal book because it kind of gives you insight into that spiritual warfare game, right? It takes a little getting used to reading it because when they talk about the enemy, who are they talking about? They're actually talking about God in that moment because it's a conversation between two demons. But we have to we have to keep spiritual warfare warfare into the correct perspective. Okay? Anything else? You know, it's funny that you bring that up because I mean, about Satan and everything. A lot of people are afraid to talk about it. Uh, we got to know our enemy. That's one of the key things about that. Satan's going to be defeated. We already know that. But it's so funny when you talk about the flip Wilson thing, it always makes me think of Revelation where Satan bound for a thousand years and he's sitting there again. And I think, why would you do that? I'm anticipating God's meaning. I think that's going to be perfect proof when everybody says, well, the devil made me do it. You know, mankind blames it on, you know, Adam or uh, Eve. Adam blames it on Eve, and in fact, she blames it on a snake. We're going to try and blame it all on Satan of our sin. He's going to be locked for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom, and sin's going to still be popping through ugly head up there during the millennial kingdom. I think that's because... It, because I mean, he said that way because it shows that our true nature right. is sinful. We don't need the devil to make no, us sin. We can't, we can't blame him. We can't, can't blame, blame him. him. It's our fault. And that's our, why I think he's going to be set and, I, and that's one thing that we did not get to talk about two weeks ago because we obviously know what happened. And that, listen, I'll take that 10 times out of 10 over teaching doctrine, right? But our nature, because of sin, is totally corrupt. Right. And as the reformers would say, totally depraved. We do not choose good. It takes a good God to save us from our sins for us to make the good choice. Um, yeah, I, I would... I always hesitate when it comes to spiritual warfare, and this is where we'll end. And the reason why I hesitate is because I'm not inviting it. I know what's happening. We have no idea what is going on in this room right now that our eyes cannot see. We would hope, we would pray that we're being protected and, and all of that, but at the end of the day, I know. I, my, this goes back to even the prophecy conversation that we had before we even started the, situa the, the study tonight. I am not going to focus on anything that is going to divert my eyes from Jesus because at the end of the day, that is all that matters. The Satan, can, Satan can do what he wants to do. He can have what he wants to have. At the end, I've got Jesus, and that's all that matters. Well, look what so, the devil has done over the centuries, getting the church involved in fighting over doctrines. Sure, 100%. And, and it's the greatest tool that the devil has used. But that, but that is why we have studies like this. And when we talk about salvation next week, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of conversations that are uncomfortable to have. Because we do believe in a sovereign God. And predestination is a word that's in the Bible. But we have to understand it correctly. We cannot get so distracted. It's a great tool of the devil to get us arguing over things that take our eyes off of Jesus. And at the end of the day, I'm going to continue to challenge you with this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That He is what satisfies. That Jesus is all that matters. So all of the prophecy and all of that, it's already settled. It's already going to happen. The only thing that matters is Jesus, and that's it. And that's where we're ending. God, I love you, and I thank you for tonight. And I thank you for Jesus and our ability to study him. May we draw closer to him. May we focus our eyes on him so that we can be of a mind like his. God, don't let us get distracted with silly myths or other distractions, but only focus our eyes on the one that matters the most. Send your spirit to guide us throughout our walk the rest of the week. Bring us back on Sunday as we continue to worship. And it's through Jesus I pray. Amen.